Hey everyone, do you like podcasts? Uh, that's a trick question. My name's Katie Alka. I am the associate director of The Drag, which is an audio production house at the University of Texas at Austin's Moody College of Communication. Here at The Drag, we teach students how to create podcasts like the one you're listening to right now. We do that through hiring them for on-campus jobs, bringing them on as interns, or working with them in our podcasting classes here on campus. I have students come to me all the time to ask me how they can get involved with the drag because they want to learn how to be a podcaster. But none of it's possible without individual donations. If you want to support these students, and I hope you do, please visit thedragaudio.com slash donate. Every penny that you donate to the drag goes toward enhancing student education. You're listening to The Drag. It's nearly noon on March 12, 2018. 75-year-old Esperanza Herrera is spending the morning like she spends every morning, caring for her 93-year-old mother. The name Esperanza is a Spanish word that translates to hope in English. She uses both names to introduce herself, Esperanza Hope Herrera. She's the first in her house to get up every morning. When her mom wakes up, Hope gives her a bath, and then they go through a routine of getting ready together. Her mom loves buying new products from Estee Lauder and doing her own makeup. She always insists Hope should do the same. They love to accessorize. Bracelets, necklaces, bags, and earrings. They even dress up to go to the grocery store. On this particular morning, Hope wears a black and white printed skirt and a white lace blouse. Hope's mother started using an oxygen tank in 2012. That's when Hope moved in with her to help her with the day-to-day tasks. So Hope moved into the spare bedroom at her mom's house on Galindo Street, southeast of downtown Austin. It's a small place with two bedrooms and a shared bathroom. A lot of their time is spent in the kitchen cooking together. If Hope makes enchiladas, her mom is by her side, cutting onions and grating cheese. On weekends, Hope's husband visits to do the grunt work, raking leaves, washing the car, but he's always rewarded with the filling breakfast afterwards. Whether it's enchiladas or capriotada, Mexican bread pudding, Hope's always cooking something delicious with her mom by her side. On this particular March morning, chocolate cake sits on the counter. Hope had baked it the night before for her cousin. Hope spends almost every moment with her mom, but that doesn't bother her. Before Hope got married, she and her mother were best friends. They would often shop together downtown at stores like Sears, JCPenney, and Walgreens. This Saturday, they'll probably spend hours together in Hope's favorite department store, Macy's. Hope sits her mother down in a kitchen chair squeezed between the refrigerator and a cabinet. It's a little cramped, but it's her mother's favorite chair. She starts the coffee and plans to assemble a breakfast taco. Usually, a neighbor comes over to grab some fresh eggs, and Hope opens the front door to let some light and fresh air in and let the neighbor know to come on by. But this morning, for whatever reason, she didn't open the door early enough to catch the neighbor, who went down the street to the store to buy eggs instead. When Hope finally opens the door... She notices the neighbor's daughter, home from college. She's outside talking on the phone. Then, Hope sees the package. The box is cardboard and square on top, about 12 inches wide, like you could fit a cake in it. Hope yells to her mom that there's a package on the front steps. Hope doesn't know about the explosion that killed Draylon Mason five hours earlier, so she doesn't know to be worried about suspicious packages. There's no reason to suspect she's in danger. She notices the address is handwritten, scribbled in dark green marker, and she thinks it might have been delivered to the wrong house. As she bends over, she realizes she's correct. The house number isn't right. It's off by one. Easy mistake, Hope thinks. There's a nearly identical house on the other side of the road. It must be for them. It's a friendly community, She knows the neighbors. 
Maybe she can pass the package along. She picks it up and... Austin 911, do you need police? Hi, fire, hi, 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 the package explodes. The neighbor's daughter, still outside, immediately hangs up the phone and panics. She runs to the source of the blast to get a better view. She's screaming as she calls 911. The explosion pins Hope against the wall by the front door. She's conscious, but she's weak. She feels behind her head to check if she's been injured. She's still not sure what just happened. She's in shock and doesn't feel any pain. All she knows is confusion and worry. And she does what so many people do when those feelings arise. She calls for her mom. Hope struggles to shout as loud as she can for her mother, who heard the blast from the kitchen. Hope's mother isn't sure what happened either. She initially wonders if their water heater caused the explosion. She tries to lift herself out of her chair, but below her feet, shards of glass blanket the floor all the way to the shattered storm door. Miraculously, not a single piece of debris from the blast scratched Hope's mom, but she can't walk without help, and the glass prevents her from going anywhere. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. We don't know. We heard an explosion and my neighbors were outside on the ground. Okay. Okay. We do have help on the way, ma'am. Okay. Oh I just have God. a few more. I have a few questions to ask. I need you to take a deep breath. We got We have a lot of help headed that way. Okay, what is your name? We don't know. She's, she's on the ground. Okay, ma'am, what is your name? Sienna. Okay. Sienna? Okay, I just have a few more questions to ask. Are you with the patient now? Yes, I'm outside. Okay, give me one moment. And how old is the patient? They're like in their 60s, they're elderly. About three minutes into the call, an ambulance arrives, and the police are right behind them. The policeman, they said, What happened, ma'am? And I said, I picked up a box, and, and, and it exploded. I'm Ashley Miznazi, and this is the third episode of Darkness, Season 2, about the 2018 serial bombings in Austin. Hope is on the ground, and one of the neighbors gets into the house through the kitchen side door. He gets Hope's mom out of the house safely. Even with all the broken glass, her mom is somehow unharmed. Hope is still worried for her. That's when I was just still lying there, and the, the, cop was, the cop was already there. I kept telling him, take her oxygen, take her oxygen. She's going to need, she needs her oxygen. And then the policeman said, yes, ma'am, we got it, we got it. But they didn't have it, they didn't take it. So then he just took her. Medics load Hope into the ambulance. She's completely conscious. In fact, she's responsive. Talking, begging the medics to leave her at home. I was telling them, uh, I was telling them, I said, don't take me anywhere, don't take me anywhere. I said, I want to stay here because I'm going to die. I'm going to die anyway, so don't, just leave me here, you know. And, and, And then... Of course, they wouldn't listen to me, and then I, I started praying out loud. She's still in shock, but she knows she's badly hurt. She thinks she's dying. She begins to think about what's most important to her, her mom. I said, oh my God, I said, dear God, I said, what's going to happen to my mom? Who's going to take care of her, you know? And then, and then I said, because... I, I know I, I'm ready. I'm ready to. I'm ready to go. I said, and, and I told him I was talking to him. And I was just asking him for forgiveness for everything that I had ever done or said. I said because you know I know I'm ready to go and I'm ready. You know, but then I said, well. 
Somebody's gonna take care of her. Uh, somebody has to take care of her. From the back of the ambulance, Hope watches through the window as trees speed by, becoming more and more blurry. Her vision fades. The last thing Hope remembers is the sound of scissors removing her clothes. Hope Herrera's family has lived in Austin for six generations. She was born in Austin's Brackenridge Hospital, which has since moved operations to Del Seton Medical Center, the same hospital she was rushed to after the explosion. As a teenager, she lived off Brushy Street in East Austin, in a neighborhood of mostly Black and Latinx residents. It's an area that's since been overtaken by bars and coffee shops. There's a trendy hostel covered in murals and artsy graffiti, just a few blocks north of Hope's teenage home. The hostel is a symbol of gentrification you can spot from the interstate, the main highway that divides Austin in half. That interstate... I-35, originally served as a barrier between white residents of Austin on the west side and people of color on the east side. Nelson Linder, the head of Austin's NAACP chapter, refers to the interstate as, quote, the Great Divider. That's how it was when Hope lived there. That's the way it was, you know, that, you know, the different places, they wouldn't, uh, you know, uh, accept us to go in or uh, or they would like, like we'd go to different, d- different stores to buy different uh, clothes or whatever. Hope's family's story is a common one among families of color in Austin. They got pushed farther and farther away from downtown, and eventually, in 1971, Hope settled about five miles away in Montopolis a majority Latinx neighborhood in southeast Austin, in the same house where she lives today. Hope's mom lived in Montopolis, too. She died in January 2019, less than a year after the bombings. But as Hope got older, she spent more time caring for her mother. At the time of the explosion, she was living at her mom's house. So then as the years just went by fast, and so then I just stayed with her, and I stayed with her uh, until uh, until that morning, you know. <laughs> and I would just get up every morning, and then, you know, <laughs> I would help her take a bath, dress her, and do whatever I had to do, and then, We'd go in the kitchen, and then I would make her coffee. And, oh, she just loved her coffee. And then she, she would always take a drink and say, oh, thank you, God. And so then that morning, I, uh, I had served her, her coffee. And, and, then, and then I said, okay, let me, let me go open the front door. I'll be right back, Mom, and I'm going to make you your breakfast. That's when she noticed the package on her front porch that exploded moments after she picked it up. Before she lost consciousness, Hope thought she was dying. And right now, so does the lead detective for the Austin police. He stands outside Hope's hospital room, waiting for doctors to declare her time of death so the team can continue collecting evidence from her body. But it's never called. She lives. Hope is unconscious for three days, and she's surprised when she wakes up, but she's still a little out of it. After her vision went dark in the ambulance, she thought that was it, that she had died. But she wasn't afraid. She's always believed in God, and she knows what's on the path ahead of her. We're going to see each other in heaven when we all go we'll go to heaven. I mean, when we all die, we're going to go to heaven, and we're going to see everybody. And, and then uh, uh, our, our deacon said, no, we're not going to know anybody when we all go to he- when we all die. 
we're all just going to be there, but nobody's going to know who's who. That's what she believed in, a mysterious place full of strangers. And that's what she sees when she's semi-conscious in the hospital. A white light, figures moving left and right. They must be angels, she thinks. I thought they were angels, like, going back and forth, going back and forth. Like, and Jack said, no, Mom, they were the, they were the nurses. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, well, I thought they were angels. She wakes up and sees her right arm entirely wrapped up in a splint. Her left leg is confined to a brace. She can't really move. She isn't sure where she is. But she knows one thing. She's horrified at the condition she's in. I said, what happened to me? Why did this happen to me? I didn't, you know, I, said, I didn't know. I didn't know why, you know. And I, and I knew I said, oh, it's going to be a long, long road for me. As Hope wakes up, doctors and nurses update her on what she's gone through. Hope learns that both her legs were injured by shrapnel, and her left kneecap was so damaged they had to remove it. Shrapnel also left wounds on her cheeks and chin. Her entire stomach was split open, but surgeons were able to stitch her up with no internal organ damage. The stomach surgery left her with a hernia on her side. Her right forearm needs surgery. She has a rod inside there now and she lost the ring finger on her right hand. You know, I, I never noticed my hand, uh, if my finger was there or not. I told him, well, I don't know if I lost it in the hospital when they were working on me, or if I lost it during the bomb. Hope's discharge date hasn't been set, but her family snaps into action to make sure everything is taken care of while she rests. Her sister flies in from California, and her grandchildren rush to pack their bags and drive home from college to be by her side. The family assigns shifts to ensure someone is at Hope's mother's house, taking care of her, or in Hope's hospital room, at all times. There's a lot of work to be done to clean the house. Their old storm door was blown to pieces, so they have to install a new one. There's glass everywhere between the couch cushions, on top of the fridge. There's even glass in the chocolate cake on the counter. Like this show and want to make your own? Let me tell you about Anchor. For starters, it's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And now you can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. True crime lovers... Get ready to uncover cold cases that you won't hear anywhere else. I'm excited to share with you another podcast that I know you'll love, The Fall Line. On each episode, The Fall Line digs deep into cold cases that have received little, if any, public attention. They focus on unsolved murders, unidentified persons, and disappearances, particularly those involving communities marginalized by mainstream media or investigation. Through expert interviews and long-form coverage of cases like those of the Millbrook Twins, Raymond Green, Robert Martin, and Elia Banderas, The Fall Line takes you deep inside these cases and explores the cutting-edge science and technology that could help solve them. I recommend our listeners check out their episodes on The Victims of Samuel Little, as well as their look into a little-known series of Atlanta serial killings, including the historical Atlanta Ripper to the Atlanta Lovers Lane murders both great series. If you love diving deep into unsolved cold cases, join the fall line on their quest to uncover these ignored stories. We really enjoy this podcast and we think you will too. Check out the fall line on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
I'm Megan Parker, the host of Devilish Deeds, a new podcast from The Drag, which produced the popular true crime podcasts The Orange Tree and Darkness, The Austin Bomber. Devilish Deeds tells the story of the eight people, mostly black women working as domestic servants for rich white families, who were viciously murdered by the servant girl Annihilator, a serial killer who terrorized the small frontier town of Austin, Texas in the 1880s. In this four-part series, I'll trace the steps of one of America's first serial killers and explore the theories behind who might have done it. Subscribe to Devilish Deeds, out now, wherever you get your podcasts. With more intense floods, hurricanes, and fires bearing down on us relentlessly, more and more people are starting to wonder why exactly it's taken so long to act on climate. Drilled, a true crime podcast about climate change, tells that story. From the origins of climate denial to the century-long history of corporate propaganda, Drilled investigates all the various blockers to climate action. There are seven narrative seasons for you to dig into so far, and in between those seasons, the show puts out weekly episodes to keep listeners up to date on climate news. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. When the bomb explodes at Hope's house, civilian FBI analyst Jordana Nesvog, who you heard from last episode, is still at the hospital, gathering evidence from surviving victims of the previous bomb. When she hears about the latest explosion, she immediately shifts her focus and heads to Hope's home to gather evidence at this third bombing, the second to that day. Oftentimes with ERT and any investigation, we're coming in after something's already happened and it's over and the scene is secured and now it's time to pick up the pieces, make a case, you know, you know, bring justice to whoever was the perpetrator, but in this case, you know, we were just, we were kind of getting hit on every side. I remember being somewhat numb or just in shock, like, oh, wow, like, we are, we are in it now. Investigators have evacuated the entire neighborhood. There's shrapnel everywhere. The bomb squad told us they even found screws in the trees. The bomber had used the screws as shrapnel to maximize the amount of harm the bomb caused upon explosion. Here's FBI analyst Jordana Nesvog again. There, there was evidence that we collected from, um, I, I wouldn't know how to put a distance on it, but, you know, houses and houses away from Ms. Herrera's house. So, and, and up on the rooftop and uh, of other neighbors' houses. The agents also want to find out if anyone saw anything or captured anything on video. They had put together maps and for what we call neighborhood canvases where they could go door to door, find out who has ring doorbell cameras, um, go to all the different gas stations, all the different choke points in the different neighborhoods. Investigators are picking apart the results of the neighborhood canvases, analyzing hours of home security camera footage to find something, anything that seems off. There are over a hundred people scrubbing through the footage but they don't find anything useful. Agent Nesvog seeks out a common thread that could lead to a suspect. I think the randomness of the bombs was one of our first major challenges. Like so often working theories are developed off of finding some similarity between victims. And, you know, one of the things that we definitely spent time exploring was whether or not this was motivated by hate and if these were hate crimes. Um, Looking at the first two victims as uh, black males and then the third uh, bomb injuring um, a Hispanic female and but that was in no way um, was it the only you know we don't we don't close off every other possibility. Um, so that that was really challenging. We spent a lot of analytical effort <laughs> in trying to find common themes between those victims, any association, anything that would help us, you know, if the bomber knew this person and the bomber knew that person and the bomber knew this person, then You know, what do those people have in common that could help us identify that bomber? Investigators looked into the victims and their families. 
but there wasn't any information there that pointed to a suspect. But the evidence analysis team did find something common among the bomb's materials. The batteries. The batteries from the bombs at Hopes and Draylin's houses are the same type of batteries used in the first explosion. Here's agent Justin Wilson. We talked to him in an earlier episode. He was the first FBI agent to arrive on the scene of the first explosion. The batteries were a very unique brand, and uh, that helped us identify they weren't sold like every drugstore didn't sell these type of AA batteries. Um, And so we were able to bracket down either the online sites you can order them, and then we started sending legal process to try to get their sales records to try to figure out, did you ship to anybody in Metro Austin? Which, you can imagine, that could be a very large amount of data coming in. Another clue, the screws that the bomber used as shrapnel. Investigators told us the screw heads were very unique and not something that could be bought in bulk. They set up a team to figure out how many of these screws have been sold, where they were sold, and who bought them. But unlike the first two pipe bombs, which were made from galvanized steel, the third bomb included an extra element. The steel pipe was wrapped in PVC pipe, a type of strong plastic, which was probably the reason the explosion didn't kill Hope Herrera. But all the other materials and scraps from the bombs matched up, which tells investigators something. This is the work of a serial bomber. When I was in Afghanistan, you expect explosions to go off all the time. When you're in uh, Austin, you don't. And uh, when you have two bombings in one day, you have a bombing period. That's a big deal. That was FBI agent Justin Wilson again. More and more officials are traveling to Austin to help with the case. And as the investigation grows, so does fear. Austinites are getting paranoid about the packages arriving on their doorsteps, even the ones they're expecting. And tonight in this community, I have to tell you, there is a sense of fear, there is a sense of worry, and even frustration about what happened here. Austin police currently have two active crime scenes right now, just within hours of each other, two different exploding packages. Two blasts today related to a similar one that occurred back on March the 2nd. Austin Police Chief Brian Manley says now is the time for the community to be more vigilant. Austinites don't know who to trust and they don't know where the bomber will strike next. Agent Wilson fears the bomber has bigger plans. What terrified me the most at that point in time is I was afraid that he was going to start planting devices at some of the pop-up venues in downtown Austin, like some of the music venues, some of the open venues where people can come in and out. Uh, my, My fear was he was experimenting with his devices to see how effective they were, And was he going to try to get us working all these ones at these residences? And then were you going to strike a a large venue to with a high, a a densely populated area at one of the pop-up music venues? Uh, That my personal fear was you're, you're, you're honing your craft and you're making sure your stuff really works. And then you're going to plant something bigger in a, in a higher, in a densely populated area. The bomb squad typically responds to two to four suspicious package calls a month. The day of the second and third bombs, they receive 139 suspicious package calls and respond to 69 of them. Remember, South by Southwest is still in full swing. Even without all the package calls, local law enforcement resources are stretched thin. The investigation needed to summon even more bomb techs from across Texas, from San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. The bomb squad uses x-ray systems and robots to scan the packages. There are two ways they do this, with a scanner attached to a 13-foot truck and with a handheld scanner that shoots an x-ray into the device. It's the same kind veterinarians use to take x-rays of broken bones of horses out in the field. If a package happens to be explosive, they have the tools on hand to dismantle it. None of the package calls turns out to be dangerous, and Austin isn't the only city receiving package calls. Law enforcement officials take helicopters to Marble Falls and drive to New Braunfels, 
City is about an hour away from Austin. To keep up with the demand, they start a night shift and get more x-ray scanners overnighted straight from the distributor. Normally, they work from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., but with calls coming in 24-7, two staffers are assigned just to answer the phone in 16-hour shifts. Here's Jay McCormick, a 20-year veteran of the Austin Police Department who works with the bomb squad. There was one down at the end of the road. I remember it had like seven boxes that they had been had been delivered the day before. And then this happens, so now they're paranoid about that. So we're going to check that and x-ray every box and open them all. We just want to make that entire area completely safe. The various law enforcement agencies set up a joint operation command post. It's a 75,000-square-foot workplace in East Austin with open cubicles and long conference tables. For comparison, a football field is 48,000 square feet. It's big enough that they have to use a microphone for their briefings. During the first briefing, they meet with chairs jam-packed together, and people still have to stand shoulder to shoulder on all sides of the room. Some people in the crowd wear camouflage military gear, while others are in suits or t-shirts, most holding coffee. They stand with their pens and pads of paper, taking notes, or they type busily at their laptops. According to Interim Chief Brian Manley, hundreds of tips started flowing into the command center. Groups of officers or agents would come in, they'd grab a tip, and they would go work it. It might be a group of APD detectives, or a group of agents from the FBI, or a group of agents from the ATF. And it might be going to someone's home who said they saw a suspicious car in the vicinity of where a bomb occurred. It might be a business owner who said, I have video of something that occurred in front of my business that I think is related. They pull in all the best people they have. Here's Dan Muller, the case agent in charge of the ATF. That's the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. It was the first case I was involved with where seemed like we had a blank check, which is to say we're flying in people from all over the country, specialists in all kinds of very finite uh, areas of expertise to help us analyze and uh, get the chemical signatures, all that kind of stuff off this evidence so that we can chase those leads down. My role as the case agent um, became more of a, a funnel point to where I had to trust the other groups 600 federal agents show up to Austin to respond, and 200 more people work from San Antonio, about an hour south of Austin. Those agents cross-reference surveillance videotapes, and they track any commonalities between the tapes, like vehicles. Here's Justin Wilson again, the lead case agent for the FBI. So you didn't know how many more devices were out there, and you're playing catch-up. You're, you're always behind the bomber and you're trying to surge and try to get in front of it as fast as possible. Most Americans believe freedom of religion is a right, even when your religion is a little unconventional. I am the mystic mother of the Phoenix Goddess Temple. But what happens when your beliefs, sexuality can be sacred, might be against the law? Bam, 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 please. Witnessed, Mystic Mother is available now. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts to binge all episodes or listen weekly wherever you get your podcasts. The day after the explosions that killed Draylen Mason and injured Hope Herrera, Interim Police Chief Brian Manley holds a news conference at APD headquarters. He discusses all three bombings. What is occurring here in this community is packages are being left on doorsteps overnight. They are not coming through the mail. They are not being delivered by any of the professional services that that serve in the Austin community. But again, if you feel like it is suspicious, call us and we will respond to that. I want to talk for a minute about the impact that this has had on our community. We have lost two lives in this community and we have an additional two that have been forever changed. Manley has an entire team of officials with him. He introduces them one by one. There's a city manager, the assistant city manager, and regional FBI and ATF officials. They want to make it clear that they're throwing everything they've got at this investigation. We are not going to leave any stone unturned, and we are going to follow up on every lead until we can clear this case. 
To that end, we are announcing today a $50,000 reward for any information that leads to an arrest in this case. Austin's communities of color are worried they're being targeted, and Chief Manley addresses those concerns. We are not ruling out terrorism or not ruling out hate. We didn't want to rule out any other possible motive here or any other possible way that this had happened. We're not saying that we believe terrorism or hate is in play, but we absolutely have to consider that because we don't want to limit what we are investigating, what we are considering, and how we are approaching this case. In regards to whether or not there are any specific communities within Austin that need to be more concerned than another, my answer is no. We are just not going to ignore the fact that the three victims that were targeted specifically that we know of were all people of color. We cannot ignore that. That is, that is something we have to pay attention to. That does not indicate that it's a hate crime, but we are not going to rule that out because we don't want to limit anything that we're considering as we investigate this case. But when he opens it up for questions, he refuses to answer questions about the first bomb. Investigators think they are getting closer after days of cross-referencing databases with store receipts and device components. They're sorting through names of potential suspects, especially those with records of making threats in the past. They come up with two names and assign undercover surveillance to watch their every move around the clock. Dan Muller, the ATF case agent, says officials are starting to narrow their suspects list. So you're, you're, we're chasing down leads like that. Um, we had some very promising leads. Um, you know, you start putting pieces together, doing research, finding out where this person's been. You know, we find he's been sending a picture of some receipt for galvanized pipe, which happened to be one of the items used in the, in the bomb making. <laughs> On one of the days we interviewed her, earlier this year in April 2021, Hope Herrera had just been to her physical therapist's office. Even more than three years after the explosion, her knee still bothers her. Oh, I did a lot of uh, leg stretches. First, I got on a bike when I first got there, like for six long minutes (laughs) on the bike. And then... uh, did some uh, leg stretches and leg bends and standing on one on one foot and raising up the foot and trying to stand up on my bad leg but that didn't go very well because I couldn't put a lot of pressure because it would hurt and that's about it just different kinds of just for my leg toe bends and Lifting up, uh, see if I could raise up how much, how, how high I could raise up my, my leg. And that was about it, like for 45 minutes. So it, it went okay. Hope is a small woman, only four feet, seven inches tall. She looks like your grandma. She even offered us lemon cake and plant propagations when we visited her. She loves to cook especially fresh tortillas, a recipe passed down from her family's tortilla factory from the 1940s. She wears bright colored fingernail polish, flowy dresses, supportive Skechers tennis shoes, and a cross necklace. Just like every grandma, she's incredibly proud of her family. Every time we talk to her, she brags about their accomplishments and lets us know what they're up to. She stays at the hospital to recover practicing different therapy movements with her hands, like picking up beans and placing pieces of jigsaw puzzles. Nearly two months later, she's released from the hospital and comes home to stay with her daughter, Jackie. For a year and a half, Jackie is a 24-hour caretaker. Hope needs constant attention. She can't move without a wheelchair and has frequent at-home visits from her physical therapist. For a while, she couldn't make tortillas. Her granddaughter thought it would be therapeutic for her to try. Because Katie told me, you need to make tortillas because it would be good therapy for you. Yeah, right, okay. Stretching and rolling the dough into balls came after months of hand exercise practice. The first day Hope was able to make tortillas again, the family filmed and cheered her on. 
She has trouble stretching to reach appliances in the kitchen. She still can't walk long distances by herself. She uses a walker. But she's optimistic her condition will improve. Back in Pflugerville, at a Home Depot, the sliding doors open and a man walks out of the store. He carries a red sign, heavy-duty rubber gloves, and batteries. He's heading to a different Austin neighborhood with another device. Next, on Season 2 of Darkness. It's a tripwire. This is the kind of stuff I've seen in Iraq. We hope this person or persons is watching and will reach out to us before anyone else is injured or anyone else is killed out of this event. A devastating winter storm, millions without power, hundreds dead. How could this happen in the energy capital of America? The market was killing people in their homes, and I, I had lost faith in it. And every decision we made at that point forward was to get the lights on. I'm Mose Bouchelle. I'll be your host for The Disconnect. Power, politics, and the Texas blackout. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Aurora, the host of the drag's newest podcast, Planet Texas, a five-part series about climate change in Texas. Now, you might be thinking, climate change? That sounds like a huge bummer. I'm just here for more cheerful stuff, like true crime. But I promise you this isn't a show to fuel your sense of doom. It's about how regular people are fighting back against climate change in their own backyards and finding hope for the future. Planet Texas can be found wherever you get your podcasts starting Tuesday, September 13th. I'll see you there. Season 2 of Darkness is reported, hosted, written, and directed by me, Ashley Miznazi. This podcast is presented by The Drag, a student-run audio production house at the University of Texas at Austin's Moody College of Communication. Katie penchik outka and Robert Quigley are the executive producers. This podcast was also reported and written by Kenny Jones. The editor is Katie penchik outka The associate producers are Austin Cheatham, Libby Cohen, Alexandra Curry-Buckner, Cecilia Garzella, Gregory Gonzalez, Anastasia Goodwin, Jay Kerman, Jackie Ibarra, Marian Navarro, Ileana Rowland, Sarah Schleed, Aidan Snazdell, and Harrison Young. The artwork was created by Helen Holsey. Christian McDonald is the drag's technical director. A huge thank you to Leslie Schrock for all of her support and guidance. I also want to thank Jay Bernhardt, Kathleen McElroy, Rachel Davis Mercy, Allison Dawson, Kathleen Mabley, Emily Quigley, Jay Whitman, Eric Tang, Robert Vilwalk, and Ryan Outka. Special thanks to Grace Spees, Marcus Crum, Raul Garcia, Dylan Lee, Jennifer Robbins, Tasha Turner, Amanda Cisneros, Jenny Nelson Gray, and Tiffany Ma. The Drag is a nonprofit educational organization that is made possible by donors like you. Please support our work by going to thedragaudio.com slash donate. Every dollar goes directly to producing more content like this while giving students an amazing educational experience. Thank you.